thick forests. Vast wetlands. Deep chasms. This is a wild, inaccessible land which belongs more to myth than reality. Here there are neither orcs nor elves. Instead, bears and wolves. This is not Middle Earth. Rather, it is Middle Europe. The Balkans. Through the centuries, this land has burnt its way into the soul and spirit of its people. The jagged contours have thrown long, dark shadows over the history of the peninsula, always in the middle, between the forces of the east and the west. This region was once wedged between the empires of Rome to the east and west, invaded and plundered by barbarians, then conquered again by the legions of Rome. A no-man's land between the cross and the crescent, pillaged and sacked by Christian crusaders and Ottoman armies alike. For thousands of years, war was the only law that ruled the Balkans, devastating both the land and its people. Only in the last few years does it seem that peace may have finally come to Europe's powder keg. It's as if the bloody history of the Balkans conspired to conceal its natural wonders. And it is these, not any mythical ring of power, that we can at last discover. The landscape is still untouched, and in it are wild animals that have all but vanished from the rest of Europe. This is a journey of discovery deep into the heart of the Balkans to some of its best guarded secrets. To the tablelands of Tikvesh, the last stronghold for Europe's vultures. To the east lie the colorful fields of Dupraca. And northwards to the great delta of the Danube guarded by a sea of mosquitoes. Then on upstream past the Carpathian Mountains, following the course of the Danube to the Kopachki Red Wetlands. Then southwards to the deeply carved chasms of the Dumitor Mountains. And to Skadasko Yezero, the Big Lake. The names almost sound like those of Tolkien's Middle Earth. But this is a real land, virtually unknown but for its wars, a land still untamed by people, the wild Balkans. The Balkan Peninsula is named after a mountain range in Bulgaria. It was once thought these mountains crossed the entire region. Now we know that this is just one of many small mountain ranges in southeastern Europe. But the name remained. In winter, there seems little difference between the Balkan Mountains and the Alps. Except the highest peak here is only 2,300 meters. The deep winter snow does make these low mountains of the Balkans unusual, but they are a far cry from those high imaginary peaks that Tolkien wrote of. The wilderness of the Dumitor Massif seems far closer to Middle Earth even the name conjures up images of Lord of the Rings. Dumitor lies in the north of Montenegro, 
thick primeval forests cling to its mountain slopes above sheer rock faces and gorges. It's such remote and wild country that it still remains almost inaccessible for human settlers. Nature not only survives, but actually thrives. This is a truly ancient forest. These 50 meter high black pines have stood for a half a millennium and are the last of their kind in Europe. These secluded mountainous regions have guarded nature since before records were kept. The ancient forests still provide a safe haven for creatures that have virtually disappeared from the rest of Europe. Wolves still roam throughout the Dumitor Mountains, and their howl is a primal call of the wild. A pair of honey buzzards nest above them. Usually they feed upon the larvae in wasps' nests, but when the chance comes, they'll take other small prey too, like this frog. Next to the buzzards, a black woodpecker has hollowed out its nest. The honey buzzards have only hatched a single chick, but it's rapacious. But the woodpeckers have a far noisier and larger family to feed. These mountains still remain as a home for the brown bear. It's late in autumn and this bear is putting on as much fat as possible before finding a cave to hibernate in and survive the harsh winter of the Balkans. Another animal that survives in the wilderness of Dumitor is the lynx. Shy and wary, the lynx silently moves and hunts in these forests. But now they are few and far between. Probably only around a hundred Balkan lynx remain. Those few humans who do live here give the bear a nickname, Medved, the honey eater. And it's a suitable name, for its fat belly is almost entirely the result of honey, plundered from many beehives. Bears seldom, if ever, leave the protection of these forests that cling precariously to the more gentle mountain slopes, but then abruptly end. The gorges and chasms that cut into the Dumitor Mountains are the deepest in the Balkans. There are no natural access routes down into them, even for bears. These deep gorges remain pristine. The greatest of them all is the Tara Canyon a spectacular example of the raw power of nature. At 1,300 meters deep and 78 kilometers long, the Tara Canyon is the deepest and longest in the whole of Europe. Because the flowing water is turquoise blue and crystal clear like teardrops, local people have named this Europe's tear. Only swimmers like the European otter are able to get to the bottom of the canyon. If Europe's tear does bring one to the eye, it's a tear of joy. So far, the almost sheer walls have been too great a challenge for any plans to build dams for hydroelectric power stations. 
and Dumitor's status as a national park has given the canyon added protection. However, responsible ecotourism is being encouraged. The Austrian Development Cooperation is helping Montenegro to build hiking paths into the Tara Canyon and hostels to make this unique natural heritage accessible to limited tourism. Once in the water, the European otter is in its element. With a streamlined body, the otter swims effortlessly through the river while it hunts its prey, often river trout. The River Tara project will prove that it is possible to combine wilderness with responsible ecotourism, and the benefits will flow on through to an often impoverished rural population. Over 1,000 meters above the Tara Canyon lies an almost barren landscape, a perfect setting for the wandering heroes of Tolkien's Middle Earth, led by the wizard Gandalf. This is a desolate plateau, almost the end of the world, bleak, lonely, and seemingly deserted, but only at first glance. People still live here. Forgotten by time and isolated by their environment, but yet very much a part of it. Stana Tzerovich is one of the last Virginias. Women who remain to do the hard work of the men, who left long ago in search of casual labor. Stana remained with the farm and the animals and the daily struggle to survive. Her weather-beaten face has seen many winters and is deeply creased, almost like the Dumitor Massif itself. One village after another has been abandoned, she complains. The neighbors are moving away. Now the fire is burning in only one of three houses. Stana has always lived here in Dumitor. The sparse vegetation can barely feed her five cows. Everywhere she goes, she always carries a weapon. But just who gave her the old rifle remains her secret. And why does she carry it? To keep the wolves at bay. There are only a few people left around here, she says, and then adds, it is difficult to live up here. She keeps a wary eye on her surroundings, Experience has made her vigilant. One night, she recalls with fear creeping into her voice, the cows were on the range by themselves. Suddenly the wolves attacked and killed a calf. The wolves took the calf by the throat and would not let go, even when she tried to chase them away. They were not afraid of us humans, she continues. The older cows tried to protect the calf, but the wolves simply tore it apart until there was nothing but blood and a few bones. It was a whole pack of wolves, she says. And when they had finished, nothing was left behind. Stana is certain that wolves out hunting are dangerous. If they are really hungry, they will even attack human beings. 
she believes, although she admits that she has yet to see one do so. After all, one hungry man will also attack another. And of one thing she is absolutely convinced. If you run into a wolf in the snow, all on your own, and it is hungry, it will tear you into pieces, just like that. Although there has never been a single record of a wolf ever attacking a human here, when people are frightened, they will weave stories around those fears, and it's too easy to turn wolves into murdering beasts. To the north of Dumitor's jagged and solitary peaks lies a different world, near where the Danube and Drava meet. It is the river plain of Kopachkirit. If this were Middle Earth, the forest elves would feel completely at home. Kopacki Rit is in the east of Croatia. Stretching out across the Pannonian lowlands, this is one of Europe's most extensive and important wetlands. This is where one of the largest and oldest river forests to be found anywhere along the Danube grows. Over 260 different species of bird live here all year round, some of them in huge colonies. For about three months of every year, large parts of the forest are flooded by seasonally rising water. This is a great crested grebe with its recently hatched chick. Life just couldn't get any better. While sitting comfortably and securely on the back of one parent, the other feeds it a small fish. But against its wishes, the chick has to take a swim now and again. Although the chick is able to swim and dive as soon as it hatches, a ride on a parent's back is always preferred. But when both parents are busy, the chick won't get its own way. Another freshly caught fish keeps it happy for a while. But that's it. Enough swimming for one day. Persistence will always win in the end. At last, the chick can snuggle down between its mother's wings once again. For the moment, Kopachki Rit seems like paradise. But danger still lurks, though. For once, this was a war zone. During the Croatian war in 1991, the front line went straight through this area. large tracts of the wetlands were mined. Most of the mines have now been cleared, but some were never found, and they can be moved by the floodwaters from place to place. A zone declared safe today could be a death trap tomorrow. It's a paradox of war. Keep people out, and nature returns. The Kopachki Rit forests were once a hunting ground for the Habsburgs, and then later for high-ranking Yugoslav politicians. Since the mines were laid, the hunters have stayed out. And so undisturbed by people or minds, all other life flourishes.
there are over 40 species of fish in these wetlands, and their abundance helps maintain the densest population of white-tailed eagles anywhere in the Balkans. Few animals would dare to try and steal a white-tailed eagle's catch, but a wild boar is not just any animal. If anyone is brave enough or foolish enough to wander into Kapachki Rit despite the risk of the mines, they'd be wise to follow the boars. With a sense of smell so well developed that a boar can find even the smallest of buried truffles, strange smelling mines are no problem to avoid. And in fact, the trails and clearings used by the wild boars are reliably mine free. To the south of the wetlands of Kopachki Rit are the barren and windswept tablelands of Tikvesh. If this were part of Middle Earth, it wouldn't be too much of a surprise to see a dragon emerge from behind the hills. But this is Macedonia, and Tikvesh is now the Balkans' last stronghold for vultures. Situated near the border between Macedonia and Greece, these mountainous tablelands are inhospitable, desolate, and almost uninhabited. Clouds move ominously across a landscape stretching to infinity, where the boundary between sky and earth becomes blurred. Few animals fit the image of this bleak landscape better than these. Griffon vultures in particular like to live in these rocky mountains, where the thermal updrafts can carry them up high with little effort. They rise in small groups until they reach about a thousand meters, and then they circle, scanning an area of several hundreds of square kilometers until they spot a carcass. Griffon vultures normally live in large breeding colonies, building their nests on steep rock faces. These vultures were once widespread throughout the Balkans, but in the last hundred years, they've been reduced to only a few breeding pairs. Toxic baits have helped to decimate them, but they've been hit even harder by the gradual disappearance of livestock. The vultures are carrion eaters, and each bird needs around half a kilo of meat each day. But now there are fewer carcasses of sheep, goats, and cows, which they can rely on. And to make matters even worse, there is competition. Even when in flight, vultures are constantly harassed by ravens. Intelligent birds, they learnt long ago that where vultures settle, there is also something in it for them. The vultures have spotted a dead cow, but a gang of ravens is already there. As soon as the vultures try to get to work on the carcass, the ravens start pulling at their tails. Bad table manners it may be, but an effective strategy to distract the vultures. And then to make matters worse, a wolf turns up. The vultures have had enough, but the ravens hang around.
and even the wolf has trouble getting rid of them. This desolate plateau is the last stronghold for the griffin vulture in the Balkans. Numbers have dropped to about 70 birds, and in the hope that the population will recover, the birds are now fed on a regular basis. It's hard to say which of Tolkien's mythical people would have settled in Tikvash, perhaps some orcs but it certainly wouldn't have been the river elves. They'd be seeking water and solitude. Perhaps in this maze of water and channels near the Adriatic Sea to the west. This is Skadasko Yezero, or Skadar Lake. With its 50 islands, Skadar Lake between Montenegro and Albania actually looks more like a vast river system. But it's the largest lake in the Balkans, almost 50 kilometers long and up to 15 wide. Depending on the season, water levels can fluctuate by up to five meters. In ancient Greece, there was a saying, Panta Re, everything changes, nothing stands still, only change is constant. Ruins of monasteries and fortresses stand on many of the islands a reminder of the lake's strategic importance during the conflict with the Ottoman Empire. Some of the islands are actually just hills, but only connected to the mainland during a very dry summer. In the lake's northwest, on one of these hills, stands the fortified monastery of Kom, built in the 15th century. A monk of the Orthodox Church lives here alone, giving up his days to his faith and his belief in a better world through prayer. His day is structured around an ancient ritual. The liturgies of the hours, eight of them every day. He believes that the ceaseless prayers join together to become a force for good, to help create a better world. In early summer, the sound of prayer is broken by the calls of thousands of birds. Skadar Lake is one of the most important resting and breeding grounds for migratory birds in Europe. The part of the lake belonging to Montenegro has been a national park since 1983, and the Albanian part was declared a park in 2005. At this time of the year, water plants are spreading out their leaves and dense reed beds are growing around the shores. The floating carpet of water lilies makes this a safe breeding ground for terns. Huge colonies build their nests, always to a cacophony of ceaseless screaming. Frogs are breeding too and they join in the chorus. These floating islands are a sanctuary against predators, but it can be confusing not every turn finds its way back to its own nest straight away. Larger waterfowl prefer to build their nests in the reed beds that fringe the lake. While thousands of cormorants use dead trees for their nests. 
Watching young cormorants feed is a salutary lesson. The youngsters poke their heads far into their parents' gullet in their haste to get their regurgitated fish. It's a miracle that they don't puncture their parents' throats. Other species breed in mixed colonies, like the elegant little egret and the spoonbill. Beneath them, a black-crowned night heron stalks amidst the reeds, while a squaco heron settles down to brood. Collective breeding is a strategy which gives a greater degree of security for all, as there are many vigilant eyes on the lookout for nest robbers and the chicks are well hidden between the reeds. Skadar Lake at the west of the Balkans is a paradise for birds, even if there are no elves. On the eastern borders, there is a vastly different land, one with a mosaic of colorful fields, some planted, some not. If it were Middle Earth, this could be the shire where the hobbits set out from on their quest. In the Balkans, this region is called Dobrucha, with its stepper grasslands in the northeastern tip of the Balkan Peninsula, between the Danube and the Black Sea. Only a few subsistence farmers live here. Fertile fields and fallow ground lie side by side, making the country resemble a quilt. Fertility and barrenness alongside each other. In May, the wild poppies and cornflowers sprinkle the cornfields with vivid colors. They thrive because here the farmers use little fertilizer and never spray their fields with pesticides. The plow is still horse-drawn, as it has been for centuries. In Dobrocha, many ethnic people, Bulgarians, Romanians, Russians, Tatars, and Armenians live side by side. Peasant farmers or nomadic shepherds, these endless steppers provide space for all. The grasses have been grazed down by sheep, making this an ideal habitat for specialized stepper dwellers, like European ground squirrels. In daylight, these small rodents leave their tunnel systems to come to the surface and search for roots, tubers, and insects. Stone curlews are rare and seldom seen and prefer dry and stony areas, so the fallow fields of Dobrucha are ideal. Both the stone curlew and the ground squirrel are well camouflaged, and if they remain still, they are almost impossible to spot in the grass. But the European bee-eater is the exact opposite. These gaudy cave breeders flaunt themselves with their colorful plumage. Whether flamboyant and colorful like the bee-eater, or drab and inconspicuous like the curlew and squirrel, they all have something in common. They all require the same habitat fallow, uncultivated land. Bee-eaters dig their nests into vertical cliff faces, but now so many riverbanks are reinforced, the birds must use gravel pits or abandon agricultural land instead. But it's no great loss, since the bees and wasps the birds catch in flight are found all over the place. This old quarry in Dobrucha will be shutting soon. But even while the dredgers are still at work, the birds take full advantage of the site. And this year they are joined by thousands of rosy starlings, which suddenly appear and also move into the quarry. This is fairly unusual, for rosy starlings come from India. They spend the winter on the subcontinent, then in summer they normally migrate to the Mongolian and Kazakh steppers. But this year, some travelled west, probably following insect swarms until they ended up in the Balkans, in this stone quarry in Dobrucha.
these birds need rock faces to nest and breed. So despite the heavy machinery, this quarry is an ideal choice. Rosy starlings have a short breeding season and they'll be gone by August. No one knows if they'll return next year. But certainly this year, they add another interesting hue to Dobrich's rich palette of colors. In the Lord of the Rings, Gandalf rode on the back of a giant eagle. But here in the Balkans, it's a sturdy Russian biplane. From the colorful mosaic of Dobruch's fields, it flies to the spreading water of the Delta Dunari, to the Sea of Mosquitoes. The Danube flows into the Black Sea and its delta stretches across Romania and the Ukraine. It's Europe's most extensive wetland, also the world's largest reed habitat. Three main branches of the river, along with countless sub-branches, make the Danube estuary a maze of islands, lakes and forests spread along the riverbanks. These wetlands are home to 1,000 different plants and over 4,000 animal species. The best known of the birds is the pelican. Its huge pouched bill makes it instantly recognizable anywhere in the world. Hidden amidst this maze of water channels with their forests and reed beds are enormous breeding colonies of pelicans, some containing hundreds of pairs. Two pelican species are found in the delta, the Dalmatian pelican and these white pelicans. Every summer, 4,000 breeding pairs fly north from Africa to this delta region. Pelican nests are untidy, and chicks depend on their parents for 14 weeks, a long time for a bird. These nesting colonies in the center of the delta are virtually inaccessible and strictly protected. During the breeding season, nobody is allowed to come anywhere near what is the largest pelican colony outside Africa. But no human law could protect the pelicans more effectively than mosquitoes. There are those who would say that an army of attacking orcs would be preferable to the bites of these countless millions of mosquitoes and midges. But everything in nature has a reason. And the mosquitoes are a key element in the Delta's ecosystem. They are the base of the food chain. Everything ultimately depends on them. The biomass of mosquitoes in the Danube Delta is quite awe-inspiring. It's greater than that of all the other animals put together. It's the very foundation on which all other life in the Delta is built. The Danube may well be Europe's most famous bird paradise. And Alash Turman, a biologist, has spent more than 12 years here. But he's not looking for birds. He's been up and down the river system countless times in pursuit of a ghost. An animal rarer than almost any other in this huge waterlogged wilderness. Finding it is never easy especially when there is water on all sides.
Alish Toman is searching for the European mink. A shy and cryptic animal belonging to the marten family. The species was pushed to the edge of extinction when some of the larger and imported American minks escaped from fur farms and established wild populations. The native European minks were outcompeted and the Danube Delta may well be their last refuge. In the summer months, when there is no shortage of food, the European minks occasionally venture out, but then only at night. Caught briefly in the spotlight, this animal could be a mink. But was it a European mink, or just a marten? Before Alej can find out, the animal has vanished into the night. This happens so frequently that it calls for a radical change in tactics. To study the Delta's mink population, Alish must first catch some. But this is almost impossible, at least in summer. Now winter has set in on the Danube Delta. The lakes are frozen. Life seems to have come to a standstill. But only at first glance. Migratory birds from the Arctic have arrived to spend the winter here. The cold is far less intense than above the Arctic Circle. And crucially, the birds are able to find enough food here. Whooper swans from northern Europe flock together in huge numbers. And when 60,000 red-breasted geese take off as one, the sky turns dark. Almost the entire world's population of red-breasted geese migrate every year, from Siberia to here. Human beings are the rarest species in the Danube Delta. This is the least densely populated region in Europe. Tourists only come in spring and summer, and UNESCO has declared the entire area a biosphere reserve. For the few permanent human residents, winter is harvest time. Fish and reeds earn them a modest income. In winter, the fishermen are allowed large catches, but from spring onwards, a rigorous quota is strictly enforced to protect the breeding stocks. Humans are not the only ones to discover that reeds can be used in many different ways. For the harvest mouse, the reeds provide both nesting material and food. These tiny rodents are about five centimeters long and barely weigh 10 grams. But it's an ideal size when you have to move up, down, and across reed stalks all day long. Their tail is longer than their body, but it needs to be. As the mice move back and forth across the shaky and unstable stalks, they often need a safety rope. Sometimes the mouse even grabs the stalk with its tail and hangs head first. Cute as they may be, harvest mice have many predators. Birds of prey, foxes, snakes, even fish. And the shy and cryptic European minks also have them on their menu. Alish Toman's search continues. In winter months, the mink must also hunt by day, and this makes it far easier to try and observe and even catch them. The biologists have changed their tactics. 
they now set live traps which won't harm the animals when caught. Every day the men put out about 50, leave them overnight, then check them the next morning. One trap's got something, but not what they want. Ah, it's rat only. The men proceed to the next trap. Will they be any luckier? No. Another dud. Days and weeks pass by without success. Another day, another try. Not many traps left to check now. Hopefully, no more rats. Ah, Titi, come. Mink. Excellent. Titi, look, we have mink. And then ah. at last, a mink. Alish Tolman has a broad smile all over his face. The captured mink probably isn't so happy. Since the 1950s, the European mink has been losing the battle to its far hardier American namesake. Added pressure from hunting and destruction of its habitat pushed the European mink to the brink of extinction. Now the last remaining populations live in Spain and the Baltic. But the Americans haven't conquered the Danube Delta yet. The mink is checked for health and condition and loses a few hairs for genetic testing. It makes its displeasure very plain. Alish Tolman is convinced the data he is gathering will prove that the only surviving healthy and stable population of the European mink is here in the Delta of the Danube. All in all, it was a good day. Alish found minks in another three traps. The sun is already low when the two researchers start heading for home. But the day is not quite finished yet. The delta turns on an amazing natural display. Millions of European starlings gather in huge flocks, forming ever-changing patterns in the evening sky. The flock hangs in the air like a swarm of midges, then shifts and changes. For the birds, it's time to find a roosting site for the long cold night. Starlings are masters of coordination in the air. No matter how many or how small the space between, the birds never crash into each other. One minute they look like smoke, then without any effort they change into some pulsating superorganism, as if from another world. In Tolkien's novel, The Lord of the Rings, Middle-earth is the land where the eternal struggle between good and evil was fought. Despite its reputation, the Balkans is not Mordor, the land of doom and shadow. Instead, it is a magical and beautiful place, always changing, just like the flocks of starlings in the evening sky. The Balkans may still be coming to terms with its recent history of conflict, but it has always been a place where people and their diverse cultures have lived. A place where much of nature is still unspoilt. The wild Balkans are still largely unknown. Their treasures so close. 
and yet still so far away.